This episode of Murder With My Husband is sponsored by BetterHelp. Have you ever had an experience that made you take a closer look at yourself? Maybe it was a conflict with a friend or family member or a major life change that left you feeling lost or uncertain. Learning more about ourselves is a lifelong process and therapy can be a powerful tool in that journey of self-discovery. At its core, therapy is about gaining a deeper understanding of ourselves and our behaviors. It's not just for those who have experienced major trauma. Therapy can help anyone who wants to learn positive coping skills, set boundaries, and become the best version of themselves, or just talk with someone else. Peyton and I in general are a big believer of therapy, and I think just talking to someone else about what's going on in your life is really important. And reiterating that your life doesn't have to be a disaster. You don't have to be a disaster to go to therapy. And with BetterHelp, therapy is more accessible than ever. Their online platform makes it convenient, flexible, and easy to fit into your schedule. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist who can help you guide on your journey on self-discovery. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash husband today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash husband. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. You know, yesterday I had to record a bonus episode for our Apple subscribers and our Patreon members. And Garrett wasn't in it because if you're watching on YouTube, you can probably see that Garrett has injured his foot. So let's just go right into 10 seconds so you can talk about it because I know that's what it's going to be. You know, it's been... It sucks. Injuring yourself sucks. And then it also makes me realize it could have been way worse. Why don't you at tell everyone time. how it happened? So I was. Wait, everyone think of your guess right now. Okay, now okay, go. Think of your guess. All right. So I was, I was climbing the other day. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what, what? I don't understand what's so funny. So I was making HelloFresh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was climbing Mount Everest. It was the craziest thing that's ever happened. <laughs> I just fell. Um, no, I wasn't climbing. I was playing pickleball. Of Imagine, Imagine that. that. And I love pickleball because I don't get hurt. Like, that's the point of it. It's really fun, obviously. But the point of it as well is I'm not going to get hurt. I'm not going to hurt myself. Mm-hmm. Didn't matter. I was playing pickleball. Things were going good. It's the first time I had played in like uh, a week just because we'd been working. We were traveling back and forth between family, just doing a bunch of stuff. And... I was playing with some friends. We were probably 15, 20 minutes into it. And there was a ball on my right side and I hit it. And there was like a little wet, there's a little like wet spot on the court and I slipped on it. And as I slipped on it, my foot went where it's not supposed to go. I don't know. It just, it bended in, it tweaked. I heard a little pop, fell on the ground and that was it right away too. Like right when I did it, I knew, oh, I just broke my foot. Yeah, I just broke my foot. I fractured something. And so I went to the hospital. Wait, no, tell them, tell them from your point of view the next part. Oh, yes. Because <laughs> this is yes. important. So that happened and I, I couldn't walk. Like I F- still fell to the ground. I could put no pressure on my foot. I still can't put any pressure. It's probably gonna be another week or two before I can put any pressure. But I fell to the ground. I got up, hobbled over. One of my friends, um, shout out to Hunter help me to like the main part of the where the pickleball courts are i sat down and i was like hey, i need to call my wife i need someone to pick me up i gotta I, go to the I, er i can't drive home i need to go to the er i need to get x-ray just to see what's going on so i got out my phone call my wife once nothing call her again nothing caught her again nothing texted her nothing texted her again nothing all caps and i was like hey i i'm stuck i need you to go get me my foot hurts really bad it's big as a balloon right now like i this hurts. Can you come get me? Nothing. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, nothing. So I finally said, all right, since I cannot count on my wife, I'm going to have <laughs> to call one of my other friends, Nate. And I called him and he right away dropped everything. Um, I got some good friends. Mm-hmm. Dropped everything, came over. Hunter helped me outside. He picked me up. We went to the ER. Or it was urgent. It was, was it ER? Urgent it's care. ER. ER. And then there comes Peyton. Um, finally after, I don't know, like 40 minutes, she goes, Oh, what's going on? I don't know what's happening. My phone's broken. So what do you mean your phone's broken? She's like, I don't know. My phone's just broken. I can't call anyone. I can't text anyone. Was it broken? Yes. Garrett still doesn't believe me. I don't believe her. I don't believe her. Well, here's my point of view. I'm just sitting down chilling with Daisy. I like out of the corner of my eye, see my phone flash. It like goes 
light and then dark again. And I was like, what the freak? So I reach over and I try clicking the screen and I see 20 missed calls from Garrett, 20 text messages. And I'm like, but my phone hasn't dinged. It hasn't lit up. It hasn't vibrated. So I grab it to try to open the screen and it won't unlock. And I'm like, okay, but he's messaging and calling me so many times. So I go to my computer. I start texting you from there and I'm freaking out because you're like, oh my gosh, my phone's broken. I'm going to the emergency room and it's been 30 minutes since you first texted me. And so I feel like an awful person. I'm like, <laughs> I've just been sitting here doing nothing. And my husband is in a dire situation, needs me, but I still can't get my phone to call or anything. So then Garrett had to send me directions on how to restart my <laughs> phone. <laughs> and it finally worked. <laughs> finally worked. Anyways, we ended up there. People were awesome at the ER. I took all the x-rays, got everything done. Shout out again to all my friends who helped me. And now I'm back home and no surgery or anything, but I just, it's going to be a, Crutches. it's going to be a little bit of a long road. Yeah. I just can't put pressure on it yet. Got a scooter today. Um, I think it'll probably be another, probably a week and a half or so, two weeks and I can start putting some light pressure. It's all black and blue. Yeah. It is all black and blue. Um, sorry for everyone on YouTube. Um, I have it wrapped right now, but you can see my little toe dogs hanging out here. <laughs> and they're not going nowhere. <laughs> sorry, by the way, this is a long 10 seconds, but this was important. <laughs> and Daisy's so scared of your scooter. Oh, she's and my crutches too. Yeah. She hates both of them, but she's getting she's getting better and at it. And she's tried to pounce on the foot a couple times. Worst part, like I'm just sitting here, can't do much, no pickleball. Can't really walk. Can't really walk. I had to bathe him, I had to change his diaper. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> but hopefully No, but it does. Shout out to couples who do that every well, day. Well, just it also it made me realize like it could be so much worse. Oh. Like yeah. just so much worse. So I'm grateful. It'll be a little bit of road ahead of me, but I'm going to take care of myself, do some good treatment, do what I need to do, and hopefully get back, get to go in a couple of few months. So that is Garrett's story of how he hurt himself, and I am on crutches. Also, a quick shout out. I've had some extra time, so I've been reading emails and messages and stuff like that. And a shout out to Cameron um, for listening to our podcast. He's also going through way more difficult times than I am. It is nothing compared to what's going on with me. I know there's a lot of people out there um, that are struggling with some things. Cameron's been listening to our podcast for a while. He has MS, diabetes, and is now temporarily blind, which they are hoping doesn't last too much longer. So I happened to come across that email. And so I just wanted to, to give a little shout out. And again, to anyone else going through difficult times, um, we love you guys. Yeah, and we're all we're all in this journey together. And I hope that uh, this hour that you get to listen to our stories really just lets you escape for a minute like it is for us. All right, our case sources are The Morning Journal, NBCNews.com, CBSNews.com, Cleveland.com, The Cinemaholic, ClevelandScene.com, WCBE News, Riddle Funeral Home, MyLifeOfCrimes.wordpress.com, and a special acknowledgement to the Geauga County Maple Leaf who covered this case in great depth in many excellent articles. So this week, our case takes us to the Midwest, to Northern Ohio, up in the outskirts of Cleveland. This is the story of Daniel Edward Ott, who was born on April 17th, 1975, to Linda Jacob Ott and Leroy Ott in Amherst, Ohio. And Daniel has a sister named Kimberly, and he grows up and lives in Vermilion, Ohio, a little over 40 miles west of Cleveland for most of his life. He attends St. Mary's Elementary School and is a member of the Catholic Church. He also attends Vermilion High School, where he graduates in 1993. Daniel becomes involved in and studies horticulture upon graduating high school. He educates himself, takes courses, and attends seminars on horticulture, which is the science and business of growing and cultivating plants. Daniel is known for having a remarkable ability to being able to get flowers to grow and for being able to find customers and for maintaining good relationships with all of his employers. He's a valuable asset to whomever he works for. And Daniel ends up working at Green Circle Growers for 10 years once he's an adult. He also works as a grower at Eagle Creek Garden Center in Bainbridge, Ohio. He then moves to Burton for a new job where he's working as the head grower and manager for Urban Growers in Burton, Ohio. 
Now, by 2006, Ott lives with his girlfriend, Marianne Ricker, in Burton Township, Ohio. They moved there three years previous for his job, and they are just about to move to Michigan so that Daniel can pursue higher earnings as a greenhouse manager. His entire career, spanning 13 years so far, he has been working in horticulture, and I think it's pretty obvious that he enjoys it. Daniel's girlfriend, Marianne, is 35 years old, about four years older than Daniel, and some reports say that Marianne is actually his fiance, but most say girlfriend, so I'm going to stick with that. In any event, they are partners living together, and they're about to relocate to Michigan. Daniel has accepted the job, their furniture has already moved up to Michigan, and they're just staying in Burton in a basically empty house for a few days to finish things up there. Now, the place they're living for only another day or two is in Burton Township, Ohio, and it's a very quiet, small town in Northeast Ohio. It's kind of described as a village. Actually, the population of Burton is only between 1,000 to 2,000 people. Daniel and Marianne are living in a rental home. They're living rent-free right next door to the Urban Growers Greenhouse as a perk of Daniel's job, which... I mean, you got to, Yeah, that's kind of cool. I'll take it. It's a fairly isolated house situated on five acres with a lake out behind it. So basically my dream, my dream home. Um, and the acreage separates their place from their closest neighbors with the greenhouse on one side of them. It's just a little south of the village of Burton. Okay. Now on May 26th, 2006, Garrett's birthday. Daniel Ott and Marianne Ricker's home is pretty much cleared out and empty, except for some limited kitchenware, a few boxes, and some minimal belongings that they still have with them. Just, I wasn't born in 2006, just an FYI. Yes, way to clarify. <laughs> just in case anyone thought. Daniel and Marianne are sleeping on the floor on an air mattress in the living room. Now that night, their house, or at least one of their doors, is unlocked. As the small town is safe, they're on five acres. Either it was unlocked intentionally or just this was something they were used to. But by many accounts, they are planning to move out the very next morning. Their car is loaded and they're just about to leave town for good. So they slept through the night on this air mattress and at 6.30 a.m. they are still sound asleep. But their bulldog Mulligan is the first one to sense any trouble. Mulligan starts barking, which wakes up the couple, but they figure it's nothing and they try to fall back asleep. However, the barking continues, and when Daniel and Marianne open their eyes, they come to the horrifying realization that a man wearing a mask and brandishing a sawed-off shotgun Whoa. has broken into their home. Okay, He's right there on the first floor of their home confronting them. They're face to face with this armed intruder. The man is terrifying in his camo style hunting garb and a black ski mask. The masked intruder threatens to kill the couple, but oddly, one of the very first things he does is ask Daniel his name. So Daniel responds, I'm Daniel Ott. And the intruder then forces Daniel and Marianne to lie face down on the floor. The gunman reportedly binds and gags oh Daniel by tying his wrists together with duct tape and possibly also ties him to a chair and uses duct tape on his mouth. The gunman doesn't tie up Marianne, but it's possible he's just about to. The intruder keeps giving instructions to her throughout the ordeal, such as lay down, be quiet, and she complies. Then, after getting Daniel bound and gagged, multiple reports says the gunman inexplicably starts to walk away, possibly heading out of the residence. Now, Daniel fears what's about to happen next, especially to his girlfriend. But around this point, all reports agree that Daniel manages to break free of his restraints, and in an effort to protect Marianne, he bravely puts up a fight with the armed intruder. Daniel grabs an object, it's possibly a lamp, and tries to hit the intruder. But remember, their house is basically empty. Yeah. The two have a physical scuffle, but eventually the intruder, who's armed with the shotgun, opens fire. Okay. The gunman shoots Daniel in no. the in the chest uh, you scared me sorry i was kind of mad <laughs> at point blank range and the shooter then flees the scene in a car that's waiting outside leaving marianne alive oh, okay the entire attack is only minutes long and it takes place entirely on the first floor of the empty home sheriff daniel mcclelland will say the intruder came into the house armed that's a very volatile dangerous situation when they occur and this all unfolded quickly by 6 40 a.m marianne is calling 911, and emergency personnel quickly respond to the house daniel is bleeding out on the floor of their home 
At first, he's still able to talk to her, but by the time the emergency vehicles get there, he's no longer talking. The paramedics rush Daniel to the UH Regional Hospital, but it's too late, <sighs> and he's pronounced dead. Okay. His death is due to a gunshot wound to his chest. Marianne is left physically unharmed, but completely and utterly traumatized. By that afternoon, she's talking to police and she's able to give a description of the killer. The problem is that ski mask he's wearing. She never got a look at his face. I wonder why he didn't shoot her. Well, I don't know either. Because he just shot Ott and then left. My guess is I wonder if he was even going... To shoot her in the first place? He had to shoot them and maybe when he shot him, he was like, oh... I mean, I mean, I, that was harder than I thought. He's still an evil person, but I'm just saying, I wonder if that's right. what, what right. was going on. Why leave a witness? Yeah. So she claims that he was about five foot 10 with a medium build. She can also give a description of the getaway car. It was a maroon Ford. Unfortunately, this description could apply to a large percentage of the population. There is apparently not much in the way of helpful physical evidence at the crime scene either. There is no sign of forced entry at the house. Remember, the doors were unlocked. The police search the house and surrounding area, but they don't find the murder weapon. Murder surely doesn't happen often in this village. And the law enforcement agency called in to assist the sheriff's office with the investigation is the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation. Also, anyone with information is urged to call in any tips at this point because they realize pretty quickly they have nothing to go on and they're puzzled. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense. They simply can't piece together a motive. Robbery couldn't be the motive. Nothing was stolen. Plus, there was nothing of value remaining at the house anyway. And why, I mean, police are wondering, just like Garrett, was Marianne left alive and unharmed? As the police go the usual route of investigating and dig into Daniel's life and his past and look into anyone he knew, they find that he as a person doesn't fit at all with someone who would be murdered in what clearly seemed to be a pretty targeted way. As written in the Cinemaholic, Daniel was, quote, described as a kind-hearted and generous individual who loved helping people and was quite popular in his community. He was friendly, he had good relationships with all, and had no enemies. I mean, he grew flowers for a living. Like, and he just lived a quiet life with his girlfriend on yeah. five acres. All of law enforcement's efforts of looking into Daniel Ott's past for possible insight into his murder are coming up blank. Repeated interviews and repeated following up of leads keep coming up blank as well. And the question remains, why was Daniel Ott killed? Police keep digging and digging, but the case is kind of growing cold. They are relentless in their pursuit of answers. So as they are looking into Daniel Ott and his life, they discover, and it's weird, there's a second Daniel Ott, Daniel C. Ott, no who lives not too far away from where Daniel E. Ott lived. Do you think Daniel Ott that was killed knew that? Police don't know, but they're like, what a weird coincidence. In such a small area, what are the chances that there's two Daniel Otts yeah. living side by side? And so they're like, does this mean something? Like, is he related? This Daniel Ott's full name is Daniel Carl Ott, and he lives in Northeast Ohio in Akron, Ohio. Okay. Unlike the Daniel Ott who was murdered, though, he has a pretty checkered past. He's got a very lengthy rap sheet. The more they look, the more they think about it, the more police believe that it is plausible and perhaps even likely that this Daniel C. Ott, who I'll refer to as C, to avoid any confusion between the two Daniel Otts, was the intended target of this hit, and Daniel E. Ott was just killed innocently no because Daniel C. Ott was the man that they were trying to murder. Remember how the first question the person asked was, what's your name? Yeah. They believe that it was a hit hired and that the hitman did research and found the wrong Daniel Ott in Ohio. What the heck? What are the chances of that? But here's the thing. Daniel C. Ott, or C., is almost 70 years old. Mm. So how does a hitman get it all so terribly wrong murdering a 31-year-old who was less than half the age of Daniel C. Ott? So this part of the theory just doesn't make really any sense. But the police begin investigating C. To see in earnest to figure out if there was a mistaken hit and whether the wrong Daniel Ott was murdered. And this is what they learn. 
The elderly Daniel Carl Ott is a career criminal with an extremely lengthy criminal history. He's been convicted many, many times with priors going all the way back to 1960. He's described in Cleveland.com and is widely known as one of Northeast Ohio's most prolific car thieves. He's been convicted at least 14 times for stealing cars. Jeez. Plus, he steals many other large items as well. I feel like if you get caught 14 times, it's time to stop stealing cars. I feel like he's probably pretty good at it if he's not serving his whole life in prison. That is true as well. I mean, obviously, he keeps getting caught, I mean, but yeah. he must not be a very... Or, they must not want to keep him in. Yeah, I don't understand. So his MO, now that he's older, is to be this sweet old man who asks to look at a Corvette at an auto sales place and then... He may even ask to sit in the car, and then the next day the car will just be gone. He's also stolen four planes during his criminal career, which is planes? showing planes, airplanes, which is showing what? Like he he's not slowing down anytime soon. He is seventy years old and still a, a car driver. Planes, doctor. cars, boats. Guy can do it all. Trains, automobiles. Yeah. Now C's long-standing nickname is actually Red due to the color of his hair before it turned white, but we are just going to stick with C. Now, C stole his first car at the age of 13. According to clevescene.com, he was a paper boy for the plane dealer, which it's not airplane, it's plane. And when he spotted the 1937 Plymouth Coupe with the keys still in it, the decision didn't take long. Quote, I drove it on my paper boy route for two weeks. I'd park it in a field, but eventually they found me. So he just stole the car so that he could use it to deliver his paper boy or his paper on his paper route okay. at 13. I mean, which, okay, like he's tired of pedaling. Yeah, I mean. He's tired of riding his bike. I, I mean, at 13, maybe it's fine, but okay, it's not <laughs> fine either way. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely knew better. Yeah. Let's be let's be real. So C first attracted federal law enforcement scrutiny when he stole an FBI surveillance van. Okay, yeah. He serves two separate stints in federal prison. In looking into C's background, the police also learned something that they believe is going to point them in the right direction. They learned that C, along with a man named Joseph Rosebrook and a third man named Kurt Frazier, were working together for years operating what was called a chop shop operation in Ohio, which involves stealing cars and reselling them for their parts. Okay, yep. The Logan County Sheriff's Office gets wind of the operation at some point, and they begin investigating these three criminals and their illegal operation. Now, Kurt Frazier cooperates with the police investigation against Joe, and he ends up going to prison. But Joe is not somebody that you want to cross. So he's one of the three men in Got this it. little Ocean's Eleven mm -hmm. people. And Kurt Frazier cooperating against Joe is going to set in motion a bizarre chain of events that will ultimately lead to the murder of Daniel E. Ott, not C. And this is what police uncover during the investigation. Now, Joe Rosebrook, who'd been working with Daniel C. Ott and Frazier on the illegal chop shop business, was born on November 18, 1955. By 2006, he's been involved in illegal activities for decades. Just as background, a young criminal associate of Joe Rosebrook's disappears and is presumed murdered in 1999. This was an 18-year-old named Michael Latimer. This associate had worked with Rosebrook and had then cooperated with the police against him. And then he ends up murdered. And Rosebrook is never convicted of this murder, although he's considered a suspect. And this is when he begins, or perhaps continues, a reign of witness intimidation that will make the Daniel Ott murder case so extremely difficult to solve and prosecute. This Joe Rosebrook, the police discover has a history of hiring hitmen to take out anyone who cooperates with the police against him you know it's kind of crazy i mean i always knew it was a real thing like hitmen but it's a real thing it's a real thing especially for like these 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 longtime criminals yes. who are doing i don't want to say petty petty crimes but like running actual illegal businesses mm -hmm. they gotta protect their business and so and there's just these hitmen out there and that just it's yes. I don't know. That's nuts. Yes. So police discover all of this as they're looking into the Daniel yeah. Eott case. And they feel like this is their best lead, that he wasn't even the intended subject and the other Daniel Ott was the intended subject. So for nine long years, they investigate this, but they don't tell the public. They don't tell the public that nine they have this years, lead. That seems well, I think because so long. you're kind of taking down a big dog. 
Yeah, I, I can see I mean, what you're, you're taking down a pretty hard criminal. It's more he's, than just the murder at this point. Right. He's attached to multiple murders, yeah. multiple testimonies. Like, okay. he's involved in and out of court. I mean, that's hard. So, fast forward to June 1st, 2015. This is nine years after the murder. Nine long years of dogged investigating. And finally, finally, the police announced that three men have been arrested in connection with Daniel's murder. Our Daniel, who grew flowers, lived on five acres when it was about to move to Michigan. Joe Rosebrook is arrested in Florida, where he moved after being released from his latest prison sentence. His brother, Jeff Rosebrook, is arrested at home in Logan County, Ohio. And a man named Chad South is also arrested. Two of the three suspects in Ott's murder are being held in jail in Ohio. And there are reports that two of the suspects arrested are from Ohio and one is from out of state. So how did the police get here? How did they find enough evidence? How are these three men involved in the murder of a blameless flower grower? The police announced their theory is that Joe Rosebrook hired a hitman, Chad South, mm -hmm. to commit the murder of Daniel C. Ott, but that Chad South did research and you know didn't do it very well and killed the wrong daniel Ugh, ott from ohio that sucks yes that sucks that's horrible so who is chad south this hitman he's 45 years old at the time of his arrest and he's from moraine ohio on march 16th 2004 two years before daniel's murder chad south gets arrested related to a burglary he commits with a different criminal associate of his According to the police, Chad South and his cohort broke into a home in the Indian Lake area in Ohio and were inside stacking all the stuff they were planning to steal. But they attract attention and Logan County police respond to neighbors' calls about a burglary in process. Which, like, how loud do you have to be to wake people up and, like, have them report that there's a burglary going yeah, it's on? Good. Well, I mean, I guess if they break a few windows, then... I know, but even then it's like, what are you dragging TVs out the front door? Like, <laughs> how do they point. know it's a yeah. burglary? <laughs> yeah, it's true. So the police arrive and the two burglars, one of them being Chad South and the other guy, are inside the house. However, when the police are ordering them to come out, they don't come out and they have a standoff and police finally have to enter the house and drag both of them out. South is laying down under a blanket when police come in, acting like he's too drunk to stand or walk. So that was their thing, like, oh, no, we've been caught. Let's both just play that we're so drunk that we well, we can't even cooperate. I feel like it's something I would do, like, play dead, like, oh, I'm asleep. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry, I'm sleeping. It Get some sleeping. It wasn't me. Well, police don't fall for it. So Chad South gets a 15-month sentence for this burglary. He's in jail from March through at least December 2004. And meanwhile, Joe Rosebrook is in prison on racketeering charges. So he and Chad South are in prison at the same time. Now, sometime in 2004, Joe Rosebrook wants revenge on Kurt Frazier for cooperating with the police against him and landing him in prison. Remember, him, Kurt, and Daniel yeah. all are in the chop shop together. So he hires his other chop shop partner, Daniel C. Ott, to be a hitman and kill Frazier. So once C gets out of prison, he'll be able to do this hit for Joe. However, C tricks Rosebrook into believing he's actually going to carry out the hit against Frazier. And instead, just like Frazier before him, goes to the authorities to help them in their prosecution against Joe. So C wants to cooperate with law enforcement who are investigating him and Rosebrook and Frazier for their chop shop operation, which is kind of like if you can sing and get less time, why wouldn't he? So he tells Rosebrook, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to kill Frazier. But then he goes to police and says, actually, I'm going to help you guys in your prosecution. So obviously, C wants to get a lighter sentence. So he agrees to wear a wire and records his incriminating conversations with Joe Rosebrook. We've already learned that being a snitch can get you in a lot of trouble, well, especially with a guy like Joe, who everyone who testifies him just like somehow ends up dead. Yeah. So why would you be the how a snitch? Yes. Why would you snitch against this guy? So anyways. It's um, so hard. Sorry to interrupt because I probably would snitch. <laughs> I'm just saying. Like, you I'm, would. If I'm going to get less time. I wouldn't. I'm loyal. I wouldn't snitch on you, but I guess it depends what's going on. Anyways. I'm a Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> Good. 
So law enforcement at this point also apparently obtains a wiretap and they record Joe Rosebrook's phone conversations as well. And at this point, he's out now on bond with an ankle monitor. However, law enforcement gets him on tape talking about a hit. This will be the one against Frazier. So Rosebrook's bond is revoked and he's thrown back in prison. C agrees to testify against his former partner, Joe Rosebrook, at this point. And remember, when Joe goes back in prison... He's going in prison at the same time that Chad South is in prison, his future hitman that he's going to hire to kill okay, Daniel yep. Ott. Mm -hmm. Joe pleads guilty and is later convicted in 2005 on the attempted hit and for the illegal chop shop operation. He's sentenced to 10 years for conspiracy. Then Joe Rosebrook, being who he is, wants revenge against the latest guy who he feels ratted him out. So he's in prison right now for trying to hire a hit against Frazier, Going through Daniel. And now he, and now he goes to prison for that and trying to hire another hit for kill, to Oat. kill Daniel. Yes. Okay, got it. Now, got it. Which is pretty crazy that him being in prison. I mean, I, I know it's a real thing. It happens all the time, I assume. I'm not, I mean, I don't know from first in experience, but they're hiring hitmen while they're in prison right. to kill someone else. Like Right. Yeah. And know. it does happen oh, all the time. Yeah, it does. So while he's in prison, he's obviously in prison with Chad South and they actually end up s sharing a, a cell together. Okay. So that's how Joe Rosebrook meets Chad South, who he's going to hire as a hitman. So around March 2006, Chad South becomes a free man and is released from the London Correction Institute. He keeps in touch with Joe, and he's the one who gets hired to commit the hit against Daniel C. Ott, who Rosebrook feels double-crossed him. Joe Rosebrook has smuggled a phone into prison, and he's able to keep in touch with his criminal associates on the outside. He's even able to order this hit while in prison. Meanwhile, two months later, in mid-May, Daniel E. Ott and his girlfriend, Marianne Ricker, are in the process of moving out of their Ohio home to Michigan. Sometime on May 25th, the day before the murder, Chad South, along with a woman named Mindy Mock Stanifer and a man named Alva Jacobs, drive from Dayton, Ohio to the small town of Burton, Ohio. This trip is about 240 miles and over three and a half hours. They spend the night at Chad South's friend's home close to where South is going to perform the hit the next morning. He's done all the research. He's found Daniel Ott. He knows that he's living here and he's, and he's been hired yep. to kill him. The issue is it's he the found wrong. the wrong Daniel Ott. Which at this point, this is where I get confused because he finds the house. He goes inside. Apparently doesn't click that the guy in front of him is not seven years old. So it does. Okay. Given the enormous age gap between the Daniel Otts, Chad South kind of freezes and he says, what's your name? And Daniel says, Daniel Ott. And he realizes that he he's broken into the wrong man's home. So okay. he knows once he's in there that he's in the wrong home. Why did he kill him? Well, this is why by some accounts he ties Daniel up and then goes to leave. Remember, uh -oh. he turns around to go to leave, but then Daniel gets free and <sighs> starts to attack him. Got it. And so in the middle of the struggle, he shoots Daniel and then Chad South runs to the car where the two other people are waiting and they get out. They get yeah. out of there. He's drenched in blood and he throws up in the car as they drive away. And then he frantically tells them, I just killed the wrong Daniel Ott. Oh my gosh. That's so heartbreaking. I'm heartbreaking that he died and that he should enough. Right. So law enforcement is investigating the wrong name angle, but they're having difficulty because of witness intimidation and with people refusing to mm. cooperate because you're in this circle yeah. of criminals. Like it, it's going to be hard. The years will pass while the investigation continues, like I said. And C, the original man who was supposed to be killed, actually continues committing crimes at 70 years old. He's caught stealing cars again. He admits to the FBI that he's stolen over 100 Corvettes in his life. So he goes to jail yet again. Meanwhile, in March 2014, Joe Rosebrook is finally released from prison after serving the 10-year sentence relating to the attempted murder for hire of Frazier, and he moves to Florida. In May of 2015, Stanifer, who is the woman who was there the night of the murder, contacts police and says, I have all this information and I'm going to help you guys out. So she finally turns 
on Chad South. She tells police that she was with Chad and Alva in the county that day of the murder. She gives some information as to the details surrounding the murder, but she also kind of continues to lie to law enforcement about her involvement. She kind of minimizes it. She would make agreements with law enforcement to cooperate, but then back out, then lie a little bit more. So it it, it wasn't like she was a very reliable yeah. witness. But finally, after a very long and difficult investigation spanning nine years, we're back to the day of the three arrests. It's June 1st, 2015. Finally, the three men are arrested in connection with Daniel's murder. And this is when police have to tell the public, we've solved this murder and the wrong Daniel Ott was killed. Yeah. Like, and imagine the, the public's just... Like, what? What? Like, this guy was killed because yeah. he had the same name as this... And then the other Daniel Ott's probably like, oh, I was supposed to die that night. Yep. Yeah. At some point in August of 2015, Mindy Stanifer, um, the getaway driver, is also arrested, even though she was the one who kind of cooperated with police. And then Alva Jacobs, the other man in the car that night, is arrested as well. On June 22nd, 2016, Chad South, the hitman who was supposed to kill Daniel C. Ott, is the first to be sentenced for the crime of killing Daniel E. Ott. At the same time, Daniel C. Ott is going back to prison for more thefts. Okay. So it's just a whole entanglement of crime. And at his sentencing, the judge actually looks at him and says, hey, uh, the real Daniel Ott at 78 years old is actually in prison. So maybe you'll see him there, the man you were actually yeah. supposed to kill. As of 2016, C was still alive and his whereabouts are unknown for his own protection because he had two more attempted hits placed on him. Got it. His notorious crime spree includes more than 1,000 stolen cars, two federal prison terms, and countless local jail sentences. But he just keeps on stealing. No one has ever explained how the hitman, Chad South, managed to go to the wrong Daniel Ott's house. The right Daniel Ott says that Joe Rosebrook only knew that he lived in a suburb of Cleveland, but that he didn't know his exact address. So they probably just Googled it yeah. and that was how. To sum up this case, and as aptly stated by NBCNews.com, the only thing the slain Daniel Ott was guilty of was having the same name as the intended target. Someone completely blameless who had no connections whatsoever to the Rosebrook criminal network was gunned down in the prime of his life, right before an exciting move to a new city for a new job, right in front of his loving girlfriend. Just think of Ugh. all the ways this could have been avoided. If they had moved a day or two earlier, if Joe Rosebrook hadn't been able to smuggle a phone into prison, if Chad South hadn't made such a colossal deadly mistake, if the real Daniel Ott hadn't stolen over 1,000 cars and agreed to do a hit for Rosebrook in the first place, which then led to himself becoming the target of another hit. This is such a bizarre and tragic case. As written by CleveSeline.com, the hit was just off by some 50 miles. The only positive thing about any of this is that justice was finally carried out and that those responsible for Daniel's murder have been held accountable. But these lengthy sentences won't bring Daniel back. And that is the case of Daniel Ott, the real Daniel Ott. I hate ones like this. Uh, that just, that sucks. And it, like. It could have been avoided. Like, not that they could have avoided it, but like it was just. Uh, I don't know. Well, I don't know how to put words into it. Right. And also, there's a little part that's like, you're supposed to fight for your life, right? Y exactly. You have to. You have to. You can't just sit there and so, get shot. So he does. So he does, but... Little did he know that... Was he actually on his way well, out? Yeah. Like, was, was he going to leave him alive? It's like, I don't know. You, you, you can, never you, know. You can't speculate that because you just don't know. But also, it's just like so many things had to go wrong for this to happen. Yeah, it sucks. And, and it, it, yeah, it's just awful. Okay, you guys. Well, that is our case for this week. And we will see you next time with another. Also, there is a bonus case out this week for subscribers. So go check that out. And we will see you guys next time. I love it. And I hate it. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.